Well, the Albanese government set to regulate artificial intelligence. It follows concerns flagged by tech experts that unregulated AI could lead to, well, just a little thing called human extinction and also damaging disinformation. Industry Minister Eddie Husic has launched a discussion paper around the future of AI. Australia could be one of the first countries to make a stand on AI ethics and principles. I'm particularly concerned about the implications for cyber security and disinformation in our democracy. Recent developments have made people think, is the technology getting ahead of itself? Companies are competing with each other to develop this most powerful AI system. And what they're doing is they're prioritising the development of AI over its safety. With AI now, it's become apparent a chance of an incredibly dark scenario that could become the fate of all of us if we don't manage this problem right now. We want to be able to give people the confidence and the assurance that the technology is working for us and not the other way around. All right, what do we think about this panel? Jenny, is this uh, a grand new evolution in technology and we'll get rid of all the boring things in our life or are the machines coming and we should uh, hide in terror? <laughs> uh, very extreme version of the question. Um, but I mean, I, I, I think, isn't it this, that technology does need to work for us uh, and the way that we use technology is, also a so is always a social choice. I think the point the government is making here is that this is a conversation that needs the broadest possible involvement of the broadest possible segments of the community. So we want, uh, when we welcome the tech community's interest in how these matters are to be regulated and organised, but of course we actually also want ordinary Australians to be able to participate. And so a few months ago, uh, my colleague Ed Husick asked the Australian Science and Technology Council to provide us with a, a, a brief about their assessment of the state of the technology. <coughs> Bear in mind it's just seven months since ChatGPT you know, launched into our lives. Uh, and we're now actually starting a conversation with the Australian people about where they see the risks, where they see the opportunities and what they think the optimal pathway is to, to, to landing the right kind of arrangements for this tech. Yeah, it's interesting. There's the really deep debates on machine learning and whether they do things such as figure out that humans are just getting in the way of them taking over the world. And I say that slightly facetiously, but this is sort of what we're talking about. And then there's the, the here and now, I guess, Jane. I mean, deep fakes. Um, you can fake voices and you could get a situation where, you know, you could have an election campaign and someone puts out something of Jane Hume saying, um, I love unions, you know, something with really cruel your hopes in an election, for example. Um, what, what, what do you think in terms of how much is being that wasn't done? The example, that wasn't the example I was thinking of, I have to admit, Tom. I was more well, thinking about what some of the thinking? good things that AI has done for us. All right, okay. well, you know, OK, spell check. That's AI, isn't it? That's machine learning. But then so is driverless vehicles out on the Pilbara, which are amazing leaps in productivity. I think the most important thing, though, is that we adopt this technology as a country and make it our own, turn it into, a, you know, a core competency. Because let's face it, uh, countries that, uh, invent the technology, that are the developers of the technology, also embed their own values within that technology. So they're part of the dissemination around the world. And those AI ethics and principles were already well underway under the last government, was the digital economy minister. I, I you know, had a fair bit to do with this. They're so important leading that conversation from a very Australian perspective. So artificial intelligence you know, should embed our values of things like transparency and privacy privacy and accountability, making sure that artificial intelligence doesn't discriminate, for mm. instance, is really important. But the most important thing, I think, is that when you engage with AI, you should understand that that's exactly what you're doing, that you're engaging with AI, and whatever its outcomes are, they should be contestable. Computer says no is not good enough. You should be able to go back and challenge. In order to do that, you've got to know that there are people behind it that are responsible. So there has to be transparency, certainty, certainly, but there also has to be accountability. Somebody's behind the technology. A person is behind the technology that takes responsible for the decisions that are made. Yeah, I, I guess the interesting element in terms of workforce as well, Jenny, is that we need to be careful to not be too alarmed. Uh, every bit of technology, the fear is people lose jobs, but technology always creates jobs as well. Is that an important thing within the union movement as well, that we don't always just need to fear and think of the jobs that go, but the jobs that arrive will generally be better ones. You know, we want to get rid of the boring stuff. 
a couple of things here. I think um, Minister Hughes, I heard the other day, characterise this as we shouldn't be evangelists, but we shouldn't be catastrophists. You know, we, we need to understand that these technologies, done in the right way, can assist us. I think some of the information we have before us about uh, how it might interact with the world of employment is that many of the business cases for the development of AI rest on enhancing the work that a, an existing person is doing rather than entirely substituting it or replacing it. So there are opportunities potentially to, uh, create, to create productivity enhancing changes in workplaces that let us do more of the things that we like to do and less of the things we don't. But again, all of these things are social choices. None of it is inevitable. And one of the reasons the government is embarking on this process of consultation about the regulatory arrangements is that we need lots of people in the Australian community to start engaging with this technology, what it might mean for them, what the possibilities are, what the risks are, and what we're going to democratically decide to do about it together. All right. Let, let's end the show on something that I uh, could never possibly uh, mimic, and that is... Uh, just a real moment of bad luck, I guess, where you're, you're not sure whether to laugh or cry, because I wandered out Monday morning, pretty cold sort of morning, and I saw on the street two cars had been broken into with the windows smashed, and they were both of our cars. So it's, it's been a scramble this week, and uh, yes, I know, no one really feels sorry for me, the journalist, and that's fine. But what about a moment? Have you had a moment like that, um, Jane? Maybe it was at Senate Estimates last week, and you thought, oh, why did we lose that last election? <laughs> no, look, it wasn't a set of estimates, but it was a couple of weeks ago I did have a moment. I was in Perth uh, talking to a large group about the cost of living and how serious it was uh, when one of my staff sidled up to me and said, uh, boss, just uh, don't panic, don't be alarmed, but you have an enormous rip in the backside of your trousers. Now, the good news was I had made some judicious underwear choices that day. I think we can all be pleased about that. But, you know, the combination of the irony of the fact that I'm talking about the cost of living while my ass is hanging out of my trousers was not lost on me. Oh, as Jane. well as a, you know, a fair dose of humiliation. <laughs> yeah, well, replacing pants is more expensive now, Jane. So um, full sympathy mm. on that front. Uh, Jenny, what have you got for us? Well, you know, I spend as much time as I can when I'm on holiday is camping. So I'm a kind of an outdoors person. But camping, of course, is one of the great tests uh, in all relationships. And uh, a few years ago, uh, it requires a measure of communication between two people in a partnership, you know, about who exactly is doing what and bringing what. And the realisation upon arrival after dark in a small coastal town in New South Wales that we neither had tent poles nor food and that all of the relevant outlets in that small town, which is quite a long way off the beaten track, uh, were at that time closed, was yeah, quite disappointing. Uh, you know, the, the, a mix of emotions, rage, tears and ultimately laughing. So, you know, all the things. As long well, as you're not like laughing. Sounds like a good excuse I mean, this... for five stars for me. That's yeah. a good five star. I, I, you need to go five star just to recover. Glamping ever since, Jenny. I mean, I always debate this with my wife. Are we going to take the kids camping or do we just sort of not pretend that we've got any dirt under our fingernails? Uh, no, we're, we're, we're hikers. We're, 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 we like a bit of okay. overnight camping. All right. Very impressive. Where do you yeah, put the hairdryer? Uh, <laughs> There's no hairdryer, Jane. I can promise you. <laughs>